From Kern Government Television, welcome to this week's Kern County Board of Supervisors meeting, originating from the County Administrative Center located at 1115 Truxton Avenue, Bakersfield, California. Kern County's vision is to create and maintain a customer-centered county government designed to garner the confidence, support, and trust of the people we serve. Today's Kern County Board of Supervisors meeting will convene momentarily. Board to reconvene. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Supervisor Peters. Here. Supervisor Scribner. Here. Supervisor Maggard. Here. Supervisor Couch. Here. Supervisor Perez. Still here. Uh, Madam Clerk, before we begin, I uh, understand that there's an issue with some of our, our streaming that we're doing from the meeting right now. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to let the public know anyone that is tuning in to the web streaming through the um, county website, our Granicus feed is not currently working. However, the YouTube feed is working just fine. So anyone who wants to tune in uh, and watch the meeting live streamed, um, if they would go to the YouTube, the county's YouTube channel, they can watch the meeting. Great, thank you. Good morning and welcome to the Tuesday, August 24th, 9 a.m. meeting of the Kern County Board of Supervisors. We'll begin today's meeting with a flag salute led by Supervisor Zach Scrivener. Following the Pledge of Allegiance, please stay standing for a moment of prayer, silence, or meditation, whichever you prefer. And normally now we would call on uh, Animal Services Director Nick Cullen to introduce our pet of the week, but unfortunately he is uh, in the Kern River Valley uh, attending to some animal uh, services related issues uh, as a result of the French fire, so he could not be with us this week. So we will begin by considering the consent agenda. All items listed with a CA above the items are considered to be routine and non-controversial by county staff. Consent items will be considered first and may be approved by one motion. If a member of the public wishes to comment or ask questions regarding an item on the consent agenda, they may do so prior to a vote being taken. Members of the board may remove any item from the consent agenda and it will be considered in listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the board concerning the item before action is taken. Members of the public may also comment on any closed session item. At this time, I will read the consent agenda item numbers, and that is items one through four and seven through 10 on page two, items 13 through 17 on page three, 19 through 25 on page four, 26 through 33 on page five, 34 through 41 on page six, 42 through 48 on page seven, and lastly items 49 through 56 on page eight. Is there anyone in attendance that would like to speak regarding the consent agenda? Any members of the board like an item rem removed? If not, I would entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Thank you. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved. All ayes. Great. Okay, the board will now hear items five and six concurrently. And that is item five, proclaiming September 2021 as National Suicide Prevention Month in Kern County and item six, proclaiming September 2021 as Recovery Month in Kern County. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak uh, regarding these items? Okay, um, any questions or comments from the board or a motion to approve? I'll move uh, items five and six. Second. Thank you, please cast your votes. The motion is approved, all ayes. I'm going to be pretty brief because I know, um, well, I'm with Stacy Kuwahara, who's our director of behavioral health and uh, recovery services. She has um, 
comments, and she has a guest. You ever, you ever guest? Okay. <clears throat> I don't think I've been up here in about a year and a half, believe it or not, due to, due to COVID. So it's nice to be back up. <laughs> Feeling good, Billy Ray. You guys know that, that movie? <clears throat> um, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I'm just going to read the proclamation, and I'm going to present it to, to Stacy and uh, let her make her comments. This, uh, the Board of Supervisors of the County of Kern, State of California, has officially proclaimed September 2021 as National Suicide Prevention Month in Kern County, and this recognition has been entered in the official board minutes. It's signed by our Honorable Chairman, Philip Peters, and it's dated today, August 24th, 2021. Stacy, it's not a, uh, a happy proclamation, but uh, you guys do great work in this area, so I'll present this to you. Thank you for what you do, and, and uh, give me the microphone. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Peters, members of the board. I'm here today to recognize once again September as National Suicide Awareness Prevention Month. This is an observance we hold annually um, to remind everybody that suicide is preventable, it responds to care and treatment, and to reinforce that people who need help need access to care and should not be stigmatized. Most people overcome suicidal thoughts or suicidal acts and have meaningful, productive lives. Suicide remains the second leading cause of death for people between the ages of 10 and 34 nationwide. During the COVID pandemic, it dropped slightly um, from the 10th to the 11th leading cause of death. Overall, we saw a small but significant decrease in suicides in 2020. This is interesting data. We don't know the full picture on it because we know that during the pandemic, the mental health needs for individuals for all ages, um, races and socioeconomic status was significantly impacted during the last two years as we went through the pandemic, stay at home orders and all of the economic impacts caused by the pandemic. Locally, current suicide rates in 2020 were 6% lower than they were in 2019. Year to date so far for 2021, we're projecting even fewer suicides than we saw in 2020. However, our own data shows suicides can be cyclical and can increase around specific times of the year. We also recognize that while the suicide rates have been decreasing, our overdose deaths and specifically fentanyl related deaths have been increasing and this increase in overdoses may be masking some of what's going on and may be related to the suicide rates decreasing. I am so appreciative and excited of everything that Kern Behavioral Health and Recovery Services does to address suicides. Our prevention and awareness campaigns and the interventions we provide to support those at risk of suicide make a real difference. The Kern Behavioral Health and Recovery Services Certified Suicide Prevention Crisis Hotline responded to over 36,000 calls last year for our county. This is on average 3,000 calls a month or about 100 calls a day. That's a huge number when we consider the number of lives that we are saving and people that we're helping during times of crisis. Our mobile evaluation team is providing crisis interventions with law enforcement throughout all of our communities in Kern County. They responded to over 4,000. I think it goes around. I'm here for you. Morning. Look, just put it this way. We can do this, okay? No, it does not go like that. Why is this so hard? Just, I don't even know how to do this. Well, it says to put it on the front. What to expect when you're expecting a teenager. Hey guys, today we're talking about how to wake up your teen, and this works literally every time.
kisses. Give kisses. Look. Give kisses. Give kisses. The outreach, education, intervention, and prevention. The department's engaged in a zero suicide initiative, focusing on suicide assessments and treatment to work toward making suicide a never event. Through social media, media outreach, education activities with our schools, we're providing education about the warning signs, giving resources to teach our kids and our families what to do. Suicide loss groups, we outreach to family members and loved ones when somebody has died by suicide. And to recognize this month as National Suicide Prevention Month, we have a lot of activities planned. We're going to be starting with lighting up this building, the Kern County Administrative Building, in purple and teal on Wednesday, September 1st. On the 8th, we'll be holding a Hope and Recovery virtual forum. Friday, September 10th, is Suicide Prevention Awareness Day. We'll be having a ribbon cutting to celebrate our new Evergreen Project mural and a candlelight vigil to honor those we've lost by suicide. We'll be celebrating the Salt Walk, Save a Life Today, on Saturday, September 11th. On the 18th, we'll be holding a hope and recovery celebration at our location at 2001 28th Street. This will be a drive through event for safety. And finally, on Thursday, September 30th, we'll be participating in a multi-county suicide prevention summit to support ongoing efforts to prevent suicide. Information about September's events will be posted on our website and through our social media accounts. We encourage everybody to follow. I'd, I'd like to end by saying that suicide is entirely preventable. But it's a very scary, difficult thing to talk about. I have had to ask loved ones if they're thinking about suicide. It's a very hard question to ask. But usually when you ask it, the person that you are speaking to is relieved to be talking about it and to acknowledge they're having those feelings. What prevents us often from asking about it is knowing what to do if somebody says, yes, I am, I am thinking about it. So with that, I'd like to remind everybody of our crisis hotline. It's operational 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It never closes. You can call on Christmas Day, New Year's Day, a Monday or a Tuesday. There's always going to be somebody there to answer the phone. 800-991-5272. If you or anybody else is worried that somebody that you care about might be suicidal, they will help. They will walk you through what to do, how to ask, how to have those conversations, and what to do if somebody's in imminent danger. This concludes my presentation. I'm available for questions. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, and, and thank, your, uh, thank you and all your department for the work you guys are doing. I know that's a, that's a difficult issue, but it's an extremely important one, and uh, we appreciate it. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, board. The uh, next item, item six, is another proclamation, and I'll, I'll just read it and hand it over to Stacy. This uh, says, the Board of Supervisors, the County of Kern, State of California, has officially proclaimed September 2021 as Recovery Month in Kern County, and this recognition has also been entered into the official board minutes signed by our honorable chair, Philip Peters, dated today, August 24th, 2021. And I know, I'm going to turn this over to Stacy, but I know she also has a guest that would like to say a few words. All right, well, good morning again. <laughs> so in addition to National Suicide Prevention Month, September is also National Recovery Month. Uh, this recognition is significant for Kern Behavioral Health and Recovery Services as recognizing successes in recovery is something we value. We work very hard at and we love to celebrate the success of people in recovery and to continue to inspire hope, reduce stigma, and raise awareness. I'd like to hand this presentation over to my substance use disorder administrator, Ms. Anna Alvera. Ms. Alvera has been with our department since 2005, and she's been leading the substance use disorder division for the past four years and really has spearheaded most of the advances and growth in our department in this area. Thank you, Anna, for sharing with us. Thank you, Stacy. Good morning, Chairman Peters, members of the board. 
morning. As Stacy mentioned, September marks the annual celebration of National Recovery Month. This observance is intended to highlight that behavioral health is essential to health, prevention works, treatment is effective, and people do recover. Currently in its 32nd year, Recovery Month celebrates the gains made by those living life in recovery. It also provides an opportunity for treatment providers like myself across the nation to reflect on positive strides and plans to make recovery support services more accessible so people can live meaningful and productive lives. Over the years, recovery-oriented organizations, including faith-based, nonprofit, and private entities have played essential roles in states, cities, towns, neighborhoods to help countless people start and maintain their recovery. This year's Recovery Month theme is Recovery is for Everyone, every person, every family, every community. This reminds those in recovery and their loved ones that recovery belongs to all of us, really, young, old, mothers, fathers, business owners, community leaders, government representatives, and citizens everywhere. Our combined efforts to learn about recovery and treatment for addiction and mental illness can help those in need access the resources available to them and to reduce the stigma that surround these conditions. I have some um, data for you. According to the National Sur Survey on Drug Use and Health in 2019, almost 19.3 million individuals 18 and older struggled with a substance use disorder. About 51.5 million had a mental illness and the reason that we celebrate Recovery Month is to address some of the gaps that exist in treating these conditions. 35% of adults with a serious mental illness receive no treatment at all, and 90% of those 12 and older with a substance use disorder never access treatment. Like Stacy mentioned earlier, um, as published by the Centers of Disease and sorry, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, in 2020 there were over 93,000 reported overdose deaths in the United States, which is a 30% increase from the year prior. Here locally, the Kern County Coroner's Division reported in, as of mid-August, 94 deaths attributed whole or in part to fentanyl. One way to address these staggering figures is to encourage individuals to access treatment that could be life-saving. Your Behavioral Health and Recovery Services Department contracts with a number of treatment and support organizations that provide outpatient, intensive outpatient, residential, and medication-assisted treatment to treat these conditions. Within our current BHRS's substance abuse treatment system, in last fiscal year 2021, 4,400 new enrollees received treatment and about 46% of them left with positive progress toward their treatment goals. Now, I have a very special guest for you today. I'd like to invite Ariana Ayala up to share her story. Thank you. I'm gonna put this right here. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ariana Ayala. I'm 19 years old and I've lived in Bakersfield my whole life <laughs> with my family. Um, I wanted to talk to you guys about my sister and her story. Um, <sighs> her name was Destiny Ayala. She was, sorry. She was 18 years old and she died of a fentanyl overdose. Um, she died a week and a half after her graduation at East High. And she was hospitalized a few hours after graduation from her fentanyl overdose. Sorry. Um, she was, my sister had just graduated from East. Um, and like everyone does, they want to celebrate their celebration. It's their day, they graduated from high school, which is a huge accomplishment. So she decided to go to a party with some friends. And um, while she was there, she seen a few guys outside the party selling, um, selling drugs that they said that was Percocets, but was actually fentanyl. And she took one and she swallowed it. And um, a few hours later, not even a few hours, a few minutes later, she was basically unconscious in a corner by herself, no friends, nobody with her. Um, luckily, one of 
the, the one of the people, one of her friends that was with her that night, she seen her, and she rushed her to the hospital. She, her tongue was white, her mouth was white, and she couldn't, she couldn't move. She couldn't do anything by herself. She was. She went to the hospital, and since my parents don't live here, it's just me out here. So I was the one that had to go and um, identify her. My, uh, my family lives in Oklahoma, my parents and my brother. So they had to um, rush and get a flight out here, which was hard. And they didn't even pack anything. They just took what they had on them and left. Then my mom came as soon as possible, probably like the next day. Um, and all of us, we just sat in the hospital for about a week and a half watching my sister, even though she was basically already gone. And I just wanted to say that I just, n no one should have to go through this. And it's sad that I had to hear about this when it happened to my sister, when this is happening. This has been happening in Bakersfield for more than a year. And it, I haven't heard about her or anything until, until it happened to my sister and my family. And I want, I want more, um, sorry, yeah, I want more awareness. And I don't even mind being an advocate and going to schools and talking about it, because there needs to be a change. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. I just wanted to say thank you for your time and listening to Ariana and her story and the Ayala's family. Um, I want to say thank you to Leticia, Supervisor Leticia Perez, um, Supervisor Maggard, for both of your offices for listening to the community's concerns when it came to Destiny's death. It shocked the entire community. It shocked the entire Eastside community. This child was loved. She was going to college. She was an athlete. This was not expected of her. She didn't have an issue with drug abuse. But sometimes we have family members that tamper with drugs, and this is a sad side effect. So we are thankful for you guys listening to the presentation this morning, and please, we're asking for more awareness on the fentanyl epidemic in this community. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, um, Ariana and Nadine, for that uh, very impactful story. So our intent in inviting these great ladies um, with us today, and also Ariana's idea, is to inform everybody of our intent to make awareness campaigns on the dangers of fentanyl to populations of middle schools and high schools throughout Kern. Um, and that's all to prevent any additional tragedies like the one you just heard about. As Stacy and I mentioned earlier, there's something that each of us can do to prevent overdoses, to help everyone to be aware how to access treatment services, and become more compassionate and understanding that behavioral health conditions can be treated successfully and do not have to end in tragedy. Behavioral Health and Recovery Services is hosting and promoting a number of events throughout September. Stacy mentioned several of them, like the uplighting of this building on September 1st, an informational fentanyl forum on September 2nd, mural unveilings that will prompt conversations about recovery and wellness, and the Hope and Recovery drive through celebration on September 18th. I'd also like to remind everybody that our substance use access line is available 24-7. That number is 1-866-266-4898. Our staff are happy and ready to answer questions about addiction, recovery, local resources, and treatment referrals that anyone um, would like to access. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank all of you for the work that you're doing in uh, trying to combat this, this terrible epidemic, and especially my hats off to Ms. Ayala. It's uh, very brave and very commendable that you're going and uh, sharing your experience, and I'm, I'm sure that's going to have a big impact, and, and I'm sure that uh, you're going to keep another family from having to go through that same thing you did. So uh, I, I applaud your efforts greatly. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, right here. Okay. I'll get out. And then I want one of you guys. Okay. Surprise, surprise. She's oh, wait until. Okay. Thank you. Sir.
very much. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, can I get one? Thank you. Um, Thank you. Switch out. Okay. Switch out. Okay. Stay So the board will now consider item number 11, public presentations. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the board on any matter not on this agenda, but under the jurisdiction of the board. Board members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make referrals to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the board at a later meeting. Also, board may take action to direct staff to place a matter of business on a future agenda. Speakers are limited to two minutes. Please state and spell your name before making your presentation. Is there anyone that would like to speak under public comment? Good morning, Chairman Peters and Board of Supervisors. My name is Francisco Martinez. I've been a Kern County worker for 18 years and I am a CPS social service worker. I live in District 2, and I am a proud member of SEIU 521. Before I go on with my comments, I'm so happy Destiny's story is being told. I work with uh, foster youth who attend East, East High, and they're pretty traumatized by it. And I was just wondering, when's her story going to be told? So I'm so happy, especially after Bob Price's fight, you know, fight story about fentanyl. And, I was wondering, when's this story going to be told? I'm, I'm just so happy. I mean, I'm, ha I'm sad about this tragedy, but uh, I'm happy we're finally stepping up. <clears throat> On um, August 16th, DHS workers who worked a hybrid work schedule, alternating days working from home and working from their job sites, were instructed to return to their job sites full time. Since August 16th, I've been able to make contact with my coworkers, um, and I've been asking, especially the veteran case carrying CPS social workers, many, many with at least 10 years at CPS with CPS experience, how they assess, quote, the current state of CPS. The last couple of weeks, I've been told they have never seen the, never, they've never seen this bad in all their years. Um, in CPS, we cannot retrain CPS workers. In CPS, we have seen an increase in the number of children coming into protective custody. Just ponder that thought for a moment. I know you guys are looking down, but I hope you guys are listening. That's a concern of mine. Thank you. In CPS, there are experienced CPS workers who will be leaving the Department of Human Services as they seek better pay and better working conditions. Some CPS workers are leaving now, not even waiting for the $3,000 bonus. In conclusion, the retention problems in CPS didn't start this year or the year before when the pandemic hit us. This retention problem started 13 years ago. This was the retention problem was 13 years in the making. And I cannot see how the county's current proposal is going to alleviate this retention of CPS workers that has been in the making in the making 13 years. That has been 13 years in the making. Can we bring your comments to a close? We're 45 seconds over. Okay. Pay us, protect us, respect us. Thank you. Thank you.
Good morning, Chair and members of the board. Uh, my name is Julia Gomez. I am a staff attorney at the ACLU of Southern California, formerly at MALDEF. Um, this mor or yesterday afternoon, uh, the ACLU of Southern California and the Dolores Huerta Foundation sent the board a letter, and we hope that you get a chance to read the letter. We, we provided comments as well to uplift the need for the board to comply with the Fair Maps Act and conduct more robust outreach and education about the redistricting project, uh, the redistricting process. Draft maps are going to be released in mid-October, and so far the board held three mostly virtual public hearings that were not very well attended in July. The board, I'm not aware, has held any more public hearings or done any more public engagement in August. So we really urge the board to schedule some hearings or public workshops in September or October to provide the, the public with education about what redistricting is, to provide the public with context about the 2018 uh, federal court order that found the board in violation in 2011 of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, and to really make sure that once draft maps are released in October, the public is educated and the public's ready to provide comment and uh, submit maps uh, about the redistricting pro uh, process. Um, I've heard many advocates talk about Tulare's process. They've done a great job with outreach and education, and so we encourage county staff to connect with Tulare County to see what they're doing and how they're able to get so much community engagement. Um, we also want to uplift the need for the board to comply with both the Fair Maps Act and uh, the Federal Voting Rights Act. Um, there are currently two Latino majority districts. Uh, a court has already found that in 2011, the board, the, the map at the time diluted the voting strength of Latino communities. And we urge the board to create a map that not just numerically is Latino majority, but that actually captures cohesive Latino communities and provides them with an effective opportunity to elect candidates of their choice. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe Supervisor Perez has a question. Why do you think the attendance is so low? What do you guys do to invite people? Why is that not working? And what, what, what do you want us to do? I mean, I think to start with, um, I think that county staff should be reaching to or out to organizations like the Dolores Huerta Foundation, other CBOs around the county, to not just schedule hearings, but discuss what are the best times to hold these hearings. Um, at a very minimum, I think that the that county staff could hold a meeting. I'll, I'll give you an example. Orange County in July had a meeting specifically to meet with CBOs to come up with an outreach and education plan. And so I think at a minimum, in the next week or two, the board could hold similar meeting with CBOs throughout the county. CBOs that have experience, as, a staff, as an attorney, I don't have the experience that someone like Lori Pesante has um, to do outreach, but I think that you all should tap into orgs that already do outreach, that already get people out to, to events like today. Um, I think that's, that's a start at a minimum. How do you believe that those that public involvement or public engagement present during a map rewriting process. What is the most helpful about that arrangement that you think is lacking in the one that we're doing? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you this much. The, the last hearings, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you all had were in July, correct? Ryan, is that right? Right. And so okay. we, we want to be able to keep the community engaged. And, you know, after the July hearing, there were, there were I, I reviewed the meetings, there weren't that many people that attended. So I think to me that would have been a red flag that we need to host more of these and do more outreach to get people to, to come to hearings or to get people to come to workshops. Um, I think the importance, the importance of public engagement is that you all need to hear from the public about where their communities of interest are, because as you're redrawing maps, you need to know where are those communities of interest, what does the public want, does the public have a problem with the current map that can be fixed while still complying with the Voting Rights Act. Okay, got it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good morning, I'm Lori Pasante, and I'm the Director of Civic Engagement and Government Relations for the Dolores Huerta Foundation. And for anybody who's hearing about redistricting for the first time, let me start by saying this. 
Long before any voter fills in a bubble on a ballot, long before anybody went to a polling location, long before anybody ever registered to vote, this board chose who their voters were. They chose them by drawing the lines of their own districts and approving the maps that were acceptable to them. So when we talk about community involvement in the redistricting process, it's about communicating to all of the people in Kern County who need to be equitably represented by every member of this board about how they need to be the ones choosing you. I've been hosting meetings and I'm getting feedback from a lot of people and, and I think my ask for today is to uh, connect with your new diversity director because when we have reached out to county staff, I think maybe um, they might need some additional assistance because sending an email, while very helpful to be on a mailing list for people like me who are already paying attention, it's not gonna get to the four Spanish speakers who attempted to participate in your first hearing and were denied. Okay, it's not getting to our Punjabi speakers. It's not getting to our indigenous speakers. Tulare County is a good example and I've been monitoring their work closely. And one of the things that they are doing is they're being geographically diverse. They've had in-person meetings, hybrid meetings where anybody participating remotely can um, chime in, ask questions. They're not limited in their participation. You can be in person. By the time their process is finished um, with the workshops in about three weeks, they will have had in-person meetings in 10 different locations throughout their county. So if you wanna connect with me, by all means, I would very much uh, like to see if we can't get people connected to this process because the seats you're sitting in are a whole lot bigger than any one person who could ever sit in it. It's about our community and being fairly represented and I encourage anybody interested in getting involved in the process to reach out to me directly and go on our website, DoloresHuerta.org. My email address is right there. Feel free to give me a, a call or an email. Sure, Supervisor Perez. Thank you. Lori, I look forward to getting together with you and talking about this. But I would like to reiterate that the maps that we have were approved by MALDEF. They were approved by this board, including Zach and I, who went and participated on behalf of the county. They were approved by Judge Drodes, the federal judge who oversaw our process, and also uh, the magistrate judge here who helped us with the final process. So the maps that we have are the most representative that they have ever been and involved even Dolores Huerta who was a part of the final negotiations on behalf of the plaintiffs as she was in the federal courthouse and in the next room as I was with the county participants and we came up with those maps so I just want to make that clear for the public I know it's a, it's been a long and a complicated road I assure you uh, that I have a lot of personal experience with that reality but uh, he, what we have in place uh, is a very uh, is a process that was uh, painstakingly inclusive, and I think our maps, as we have them, are representative of that. And if you think about you know the parties, the stakeholders that agreed to the final map, so I, I really appreciate your passion. I, I know your heart, so I look forward to uh, understanding how you believe that public input in this. Uh, as it is occurring elsewhere, not here, is meaningful to the final maps. I'm still not there yet. Uh, I, I just I want to know what we're missing so that we can fix what's missing. Uh, I'm not I'm not 100% convinced. You know, 10 more meetings that may not be attended by very many people are necessarily going to do what you're asking. But this is not agendized, so we'll, we'll talk about this later. Uh, but I would like to meet with you and talk to you about my experience and get you up to speed on, you know, why why I, I trust the process that we have had. And I and I think this going forward, you know, should probably be a little more amicable given mm. the length and the extension of resources and time and thought going into our last map process. Not in 2011, I wasn't here. And it wasn't this board, it was a different board, uh, in all fairness. Uh, but uh, here we are now and we really should uh, work hard to make sure that we're transparent and Spanish speakers have a participation opportunity uh, but I also need to understand your methodology a little bit clearer and I think it would be better uh, in person so I look forward to getting together with you thank you for what you're doing there uh, and I look forward to a, a good process that's inclusive and that uh, meet, you know moves us forward as a community and 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 not 
using this issue as a wedge issue in a time where I think we need uh, unity and and communication uh, more than ever. So I trust that you're a good faith player in that process uh, because I know these folks here uh, would like to make a map that's fair and move on. I, I believe that. Um, so let's, you know, let's have a meeting of the minds. Agreed. And um, the current map is based on 2010 data. Uh, so the map uh, will definitely need to reflect the fact that Kern County has increased by population by about 69,000 and for the first time has a majority Latino population, which has never happened before. So there are substantial things to, to converse with you, you about. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Larry. Real quick, I wanted to uh, uh, call on our uh, County Council, Margo Rizon. Thank, thank you. Um, uh, I, Staff from the CAO's office, as well as my office and myself, have participated in uh, the workshops that we've had to date. We had one in early uh, or mid April, and then we had two virtual uh, workshops in July. The one, it was at, both were at six o'clock. The first one was in English with Spanish and Punjabi translation available. The next night, Tuesday, starting at six o'clock, it was a Spanish workshop with English and Punjabi translation. And then on a Saturday morning here in your chambers, we had a workshop that was both live and uh, call-in. And then we've scheduled, uh, so far there's a uh, Board of Supervisors meetings and public hearings scheduled for September 28th, October 26th, November 8th, November 16th. And uh, just yesterday, our little, our internal redistricting team had a meeting, discussed scheduling another workshop, I believe we decided on September 7th, um, in the evening to have yet another opportunity um, to uh, receive public comment, uh, have people draw maps of communities of interest, uh, explain how the uh, software program, it's called District R, where people can use that to draw communities of interest, how all of that will work. So we are continuing uh, the momentum of moving forward. I believe last week, more than 200 uh, notices were sent out to um, CBOs with the, with the schedule of uh, workshops and board meetings that we're having. So I just wanted to share that information with the board. Uh, can I say something? Chair. Oh, go ahead, Dave. I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Oh, it, thank you so much for that. Uh, for clarifying that. You've heard from members of the public how they feel. You know, as we know, as you know, uh, this business is often, you know, perception trumping reality or not. I, it's not for me to say. There's folks here who feel left out or don't feel as though they've been engaged. I think that's an easy fix because I do know how hard we're working to get out and communicate to the public. So, you know, I think with a small tweak here, we can demonstrate you know, with action that uh, we're not enemies here. This is one community. We're neighbors. We all live in the same community. So there is no us, them here. It shouldn't be. Uh, but if folks feel that way from the public, you know, I think we can make small tweaks to deal with, you know, some of the more emotional aspects of this, which are quite complicated. Uh, and, um, and maybe there are things I'm going to hear from Lori and folks about ideas they have and I'm happy to do everything I can to ensure that they happen but I think a small tweak here will address the way some people feel and uh, it's important to remember that you know whoever whoever the group may be and whatever the issue may be so thank you thank you thank you uh, supervisor couch thank you mr. chairman uh, have we is there any change in when we're going to get the census data because that's, to me, we're having, we're having meetings about talking about the process, which include having meetings. And we're not really getting to, and I don't know when we're going to be able to get to, here's what the data says, here's what the populations are, here's, here's the changes that, we, that somebody thinks could be made based on the data. So I don't know, last I heard it was around... October 1st, that we would expect that, maybe October 15th. Is that changed at all? Because I think you mentioned a date after that. Right. I know we had a very compressed schedule. 
that, that is correct. Last week, I believe it was last week, around August 15th, there was a release of census data that's called legacy data, which is just some raw numbers right now, which, um, as Ms. Passanti referenced, it shows various increases in our population and some very rough numbers. Then uh, that information will be uh, finalized a bit more and released to the states. And then California has 30 days to have that information. And what California will do is um, uh, calculate or take out the number of prisoners that are located in the various uh, state prisons and reassign them or their numbers to the the counties and the areas from where they where they came from as opposed to where they are being housed and the state anticipates that that will take about 30 days and then that's when end of September is kind of the the thought right now when that the the actual numbers will be released to the county so what we have been working on uh, knowing that we don't have actual numbers right now but we have been encouraging people to submit information about communities of interest and edu trying to educate people about the process so that once the numbers are actually received and lines can really be drawn that have more meaning will be good to go and the community will also be informed of the process um, as well as have submitted anybody who wants to communities of interest that then will be factored into uh, the line drawing once actual numbers uh, are received and in place. So I don't really want to, Mr. Chairman, I don't really want to belabor this today, but are you saying that the states have the numbers, the rough numbers that they're going to, they have to work with before they release those to the county, or that has that not even happened? Yet? That has not happened. Okay. It's it's happening. So what what are these rough numbers? Like here's the population of the United States. Okay. So the People rough numbers that that um, just that I just reviewed uh, yesterday do indicate the population growth in Kern County, and based on the current. Uh, district boundaries, the population of those bound of the boundaries, but it does not take into account the uh, prison numbers. H hang on, the, the the rough numbers indicate <coughs> changes in the population on a district basis. Believe so, yes. Well, that's not that rough. But they're not. They're <laughs> not. They haven't been finalized. It's it's a they're they're it's a. So that is the number that the states well will. Uh, We'll get into this at another at another time, but that okay. seems to be the number that the states get. The states then back out the well, prison population. Once they're finalized to the state. You'll have to educate me on how you, you finalize a number one of these days, but thank you. Uh, thank you. Can I ask that? Sure. Are you saying that the population in Kern County grew by 69,000 people? We know that right now. Yes, and I... Do, and I if you give me a minute, I will pull up. It's okay. It's okay. Report. It's not agendized. Yes, My apologies again to the ch to the chair. According to the initial. But Lori, I look forward to discussing it with you and your team uh, as soon as possible. I'm assuming you've read Judge Drode's decision, his 70 pages, 77 pages. I would. That's very helpful in us kind of going. Okay, what issues do we think the public and the board need to know more of so that the final technical decision incorporates that information? Um, that would be helpful. So thank you. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Chair. Thank Appreciate you. It. And David, thank you. Can we get our next speaker, please? Supervisors, not to drag this on, but just to roughly say what, uh, what Lori was saying about not enough information you... given out to the... Can you state your uh, name? Nadine Escalante. Thank you. Sorry. Um, there isn't enough information going out to the community. I wasn't even aware of redistricting until Lori started missing one of our meetings and filled me in. As I've talked to my family members that live out in um, Rosemond in the Mojave, dist Mojave area, they're not even aware of these things. Um, suggestions I would say to get more participation from the community is for you guys to share the next upcoming meetings on your own social media pages, um, on the county social media pages, and I'm not sure if you have Instagram. I know this is something that we have done with um, Bakersfield Policing to get more involvement for our community workshops. We've really made more of an effort of us as a team and to share things on all of our 
um, social media, not just on BPDs. So just a quick suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Oh, Mike Maggard walks away. Very good. A great representative for the county. Amazing. I want to make Could clear. We have your name, please. My name is Riddhi Patel. You know who I am. Philip Peters, Leticia Perez. You said there isn't an us them situation. I want to remind the public behind me that everyone, every single one of you, makes more than a hundred, way more than a hundred thousand dollars a year. Ryan Alsop, the county administrative officer, makes more than four hundred thousand dollars a year, and many of the community mem members behind me could not even imagine making that much money as I make forty-five thousand a year. My father's now ever made more than 53,000 and my mother's works roughly 12 hours a day for our public school system and other local groups to make roughly $23,000 a year. So when you don't when you say this isn't an us them situation, let's recap. Let's look at the last year. You voted on a budget last year when we were in the middle of a global pandemic to fund a sheriff's department instead of actually addressing the root issues while we were while we were in the middle of a global pandemic and addressing issues of health care, inequity, poverty, and actual things that cause crime. You decided to pull $1.2 million from community groups here in Kern because they showed support for defunding the police last summer, and you let communities suffer. That are literally just Ms. asking Patel, for sidewalks. Please. I'm not finished. Okay, then I'm asking on, you. Then you went on. I'm asking you. No. Yes. You okay. Hey. Excuse me, they're... Okay. Okay, could, could we please remove her from the chamber? Thank you. We have our next speaker, please. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name's Sonia Bennett, S-O-N-J-A-B-E-N-N-E-T-T. -T. I'm a constituent of the second district and a happily retired Kern County employee after 25 years of service. Thank you. Today I stand here as a representative of nine Kern community groups. We've come together as we share similar goals and objectives in serving our community safety, health, and well-being. For over a decade, we've watched the county divest from services, resources, and opportunities that deserving residents now believe are out of reach. We have seen requests come to this board year after year with most remaining unfilled. Please for paved roads and lights, please for mental health services, please for investment in homeless services and housing are just a few. Today, we're standing together and submitting a joint statement for public record. I've left a copy there. The Kern County Board of Supervisors has never prioritized our community needs. Today, Kern County has never been in a stronger fiscal position, sitting on a net worth of more than $900 million and a record-breaking property tax assessment roll. The proposed budget pays lip service to the county's homeless problems. While homelessness grew 143% from 2018 to 2021, the county has put zero county dollars on much needed services and housing, relying instead on state and federal funds. The in-home support services program has been neglected. The IHSS program provides services to seniors and peoples with disabilities. From 2015 to 2019, the average number of IHSS recipients who lost access to care tripled from 296 to 923 consumers per month. County governments do need to balance the books, but they shouldn't be building reserves at the expense of the residents they're supposed to serve. Kern County can do much, much more for residents 
without raising a penny in taxes. We need a budget that works for all Kern County residents. Thank you for your time, and we look forward to seeing the finalization of this budget next week. We will be watching, and sincerely, the American Civil Liberties Union, the Center for Race, Poverty, and the Environment, Democratic Women of Kern, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, Faith in the Valley, Kern Inyo and Mono County, Central Labor Council, Service Employees International Union Local 521. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're about a minute over right now. Sierra Club, Kern Cahuilla Chapter, and the United Domestic Workers. Thank you. Thank you. Could we have our next speaker, please? Good morning, Supervisors. I'm Kathy Romley. Nice to see you all here today. This message given forward here today is simple. Invest. Invest in our people. Invest in our community. Invest in our workers. Kern County consistently lags behind other California counties in areas that impact health and safety for its constituents. I think it's 57 out of 58. Our people deserve to have healthy and safe lives and issues such as mental health and access to primary health concerns are key to a solid and thriving community. The workers in Kern County are doing their best to address these important issues, but they can't do it without support. Stagnant wages and high turnover lead to short staffing, and this further complicates the ability to provide the services to our community members in need. Please recognize the contributions of these very critical workers and support them in the ways that they support our community. If this past year and a half has shown us nothing else, it is that community does not exist if we don't support one another. Thank you for your service is all fine and good but it doesn't pay the rent. Our workers do the best they can year after year, but they never seem to be the priority when budgets are considered. We are asking that the board recognize that fact and make our essential workers truly essential. Thank you. Thank you. Could we have our, <laughs> could we have our next speaker, please? Okay, seeing no more uh, public speakers, the board will now consider item number 12, and that's board member announcements or reports. I'm sorry. Oh, that's the exactly Supervisor right. Couch. Uh, I noticed that today um, our Ad Commissioner, uh, Glenn Fankhauser, is in the audience, and I wanted to, um, Glenn, ask you if you could, wouldn't mind uh, coming up to the microphone. You've been the subject of some public comments um, in the past, <clears throat> recent past, I should say. Um, and I know, I just would like you to give us your comments on some of the history. Most of the comments revolve around AB 617, your involvement in that, and then also the, the, the pesticide notification issue. Um, so could you, I don't know if you want to, how far you want to go back or um, whatever the recent history is, but I wanted to give an, you an opportunity to just respond to some of those comments that have been made lately. Sure, I appreciate that. And uh, questions that have been made. Thank you. Supervisor Couch through the chair. Um, I, and <clears throat> I may need, need your help at some point um, in case I don't hit on everything you want me to hit on. But uh, the notification issue has come up as a result, as you mentioned, of the AB 617 community, which is in Shafter, which is designed to um, improve air quality um, with the input of residents um, as a committee uh, to identify possible sources of pollution that could contribute to bad air in their community. Um, pretty early on, the committee identified uh, pesticides as a possible source of emissions that, that could lead to bad air quality. Um, and that's where the notification issue came up. Um, I don't believe that it's notification of restricted materials, because those are the only ones that my office is notified ahead of time of the applications. The vast majority of pesticide applications that occur in Kern County um, 
we don't know about ahead of time. We only find out after the fact because growers are required to submit use reports uh, reporting their usage of, of pesticides. Um, so we would only be able to provide notification of restricted materials which are considered uh, a more dangerous type of pesticide. Um, I don't believe that the call for public notification of pesticides uh, came directly from the residents of Shafter. The reason I believe that is there are representatives of statewide activist groups that are not residents, that are members of the Shafter Steering Committee, that have for long before uh, the Shafter AB 617 co committee was formed, have asked me to provide public notification of, of pesticides. So I don't think that it came directly from the residents of Shafter. Um, nevertheless, it was included in the final document, um, which was called the SERP, which stands for Community Emission Reduction Program, um, designed to reduce emissions. And I'd like to make the point that public notification of pesticide applications doesn't reduce emissions. There's not going to be any fewer application of pesticides, so it's not going to clean the air necessarily. Um, so it's not really the direction that the um, AB 617 is supposed to take. Um, nevertheless, the, it wasn't a direct, what was included in the SERP um, was not a directive to my office to implement a notification, but rather a directive to the State Department of Pesticide Regulation to work with me to possibly identify um, a potential uh, for pesticide notification in Kern County that would work for Shafter. Um, Uh, is there another specific question I could? Well, um, there's also been comments made at the, at the podium that there's, and I've forgotten the number, I want to say $10 million in the state budget specifically for this. I don't, and I've been, I've been told two things on that. I've been told that by, by the person speaking at the podium, and I've also been told that that money in the state budget is for planning purposes to implement a statewide notification program. So could you, could you clarify sure. that? Okay. So there was money allocated in the SERP uh, for Shafter for notification. Um, I believe it was uh, about a quarter of a million dollars for a notification program to implement a Shafter if we could identify one that, that could happen. Um, now, we haven't been able to agree upon a notification pilot in Shafter. Um, I've made it very clear that I don't believe that a public notification is going to accomplish what they believe it will accomplish. The arguments are that um, it will allow residents to close their windows, um, bring in um, uh, laundry from outside, try and protect themselves in some way, um, in addition to what they would normally do. Uh, the problem is that even though there is a time and date which is located on, on the uh, NOI, which stands for Notice of Intent, that we receive, um, it's not a hard and fast rule that they must uh, begin that application at that time. And the reason is because weather can change, temperature can change, there can be variables that the grower needs to take into account um, to make it a safe application. And so there's up to a four-day window where that pesticide application can occur. So for residents to change their behavior for a period of up to four days um, until an application is, is concluded, I, I, don't, I don't know that that's a reasonable um, thing that would happen. Can, can I ask you just a kind of a nuanced question about that? Sure. That's, and I believe this is the case, that's not necessarily a county ordinance, right? You're following state law. That's state law, state regulation, yes. So a lot of, okay, well then, Maybe maybe speak to the. Um, and I haven't addressed the money, but I, I will okay, at go, some point. But d um, d let me stay out of it then. You <laughs> proceed. <laughs> um, I'll do my best, but I'm not I'm not a great public speaker. Right. But Supervisor Perez, did you have a question right there? When Supervisor Couch is done, I, I want to chime in. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Um, so, the, the, I, I want to make it clear that these are all um, when we receive an NOI. Every one of those notice of intents is reviewed by my office to make sure that it's, um, it's a safe application, it's meeting all the requirements of state law, state regulation. It's, it, it could be safe if, if it's performed according to the label and according to all state laws. Um, 
particularly with regard to fumigants, which I may touch on later, which are more, more dangerous, more apt to, um, to uh, off-gas into the environment. For every fumigant NOI that we receive, one of my biologists physically visits the location prior to the application to see if there are any conditions out in the field physically that would make that an unsafe application. Um, so these are all legal applications that would go about. When we approve one, we've looked at it. It's, we're not willy-nilly um, approving every NOI that we receive. Um, we reject them if there's a mistake on them, if they need to change something. Um, we have them change it and resubmit. Um, so uh, with regard to the money that's allocated, even though there's money that's allocated in the AB 617 for a local notification project that, like I say, um, we haven't really ad agreed upon one yet, if there is to be one. Um, as a result of the AB 617 Shafter Committee push, um, the state has allocated $10 million for a statewide notification program. Uh, and that's what it is. As you mentioned, it's, it's essentially a study to identify how that program would be um, composed and how it would be implemented. It's not necessarily to begin one, but just to look at several aspects of it. So right now we're currently in that process, and as part of that process, uh, the state has approached many ag commissioners across the state to possibly have a notification pilot that would be regionally specific to identify if there's a statewide program, how that program is going to be implemented and what the best way to go about that is. So I'm in talks with DPR to possibly have one in Kern. Doesn't mean that there will be one, but we'll look at it. Um, I did uh, make an offer of a notification program that was not easily made. Um, it was based on one material, which is called 1,3-D, which is a fumigant. And the reason I chose that is because the state has had air monitors in Shafter and throughout the state for many years. Um, and they've only had exceedances, um, not unhealthy exceedances, but exceedances in a few locations in the valley for Talone, for the 1,3-D. So um, as a result of that, the state is, they're not unhealthy, they're just higher than they would normally expect from these applications. So the state has uh, begun a pilot where they're looking at specific applications of different kinds in different locations in the valley, including Kern. Um, so hand in hand with that, uh, the notification offer that I made was related to only that fumigant. Um, I doubled the notification distance from 100 to 200 feet. And one of the worries is that there is an existing pilot notification in Monterey County. And a lot of the people that signed up for notification, as the majority of them, were not residents of Monterey County and were not residents of the state of California. The majority were residents from outside of Monterey County. So they wouldn't even really be affected by the, any applications that would occur. So to address that for my growers, um, I only wanted to notify people that possibly could be affected. So the, the notification wasn't an online notification or a text notification. It was a door hanger notification, a physical notification that, that put the grower in contact with the resident. So um, that alleviated my concern that people not associated or not able to be affected by the application would be notified. So that was the offer that I made. Um, I participated, or a representative from my office has participated in the AB 617 meetings nearly from the beginning. Um, but at some point last year, when there was a subcommittee meeting, my participation changed more to one of observer. Um, after I made that offer, and I was essentially attacked for that offer. And it was clear to me that I wasn't going to be a participant in designing a workable notification. I was instead going to be told by both the activists and by the state how that was going to be. And I just want to make clear, there's no law or regulation in the state that requires public notification. So.
so where do, where do we stand now with the folks? Uh, I don't want to I don't want to lump them in one in one lump, but the people that are concerned about this and that are expressing it. Um, are they proceeding down? I, I think if you go to the, let me back up and say, if, if we go through the process you just sort of described at the state level, there's probably legislation, there's probably a rulemaking, there's got to be a rulemaking process. Everybody gets to have their say, gets to have their input. That seems to be the fairest way of going about this, but that could take a long time. Agreed. Okay. Um, so is that where we sort of stand right now? Yes, that's, that's where we that's stand. That process is barely getting off the ground? It, it is, but it's, you know, this has been in discussion for a long time. So it's not like we're starting from scratch. Okay. And as I said there, you know, we have a, a grower to grower notification um, that could be used as a template and Monterey County has a, a notification around certain schools that could be used as a template. So it's not, we're not beginning from scratch, but um, it is going to take time, which leads to the pressure from AB 617, they don't want to wait. And so they want to implement a pilot in Kern right now. They don't want to wait for that. So in, they don't really view the statewide as a win, which in my mind it is. And to be clear, even though I, <coughs> excuse me, even though I don't agree with um, a notification system for the public, um, if it's a state regulation that we have to follow, I'll, we'll do it and I'll implement it. I'm not going to refuse to... to sure to um, enforce state law. We do that all the time. Um, there are many regulations I don't agree with that I still have to enforce, so I would enforce it. Um, I don't have a problem with that. And, you know, to that point, you know, there have been some talk about, you know, that I'm not doing my job. Well, if that's only based on me not implementing uh, notification in Shafter, um, there's only one other notification in the in the state notification system in Monterey County. So there's 53 other ag commissioners who aren't implementing notification who also aren't doing their job if I'm not doing my job. And to that point, um, Kern County is the only county in the state that issues a fine for every violation of pesticide laws and regulations that we find. Hmm. Similarly, we have the highest fine levels in the state. So I find it hard to believe that I, uh, I don't believe in enforcing pesticide regulations. So where it stands right now is the Air District put that, uh, the piece about uh, notification in the SERP. Right. And uh, your offer is to notify people with a door hanger within 200 feet of the parcel. That's, that's, being, that's being applied right. to, right. And that's under consideration or it's been rejected? Well, it's, How would you it's say? been rejected. And to be clear, it wasn't rejected by the Shafter Steering Committee because it never really came up for a vote. It was instead essentially rejected by the activist representatives um, in not so many okay. words. Um, that, that kind of is no longer on the table in the same way that it used to be. And the reason is because now we have a second AB 617 community in, Shafter, in uh, Lamont and Arvin. And so the fear is, you know, if we implement a notification pilot in Shafter, we have the same representatives that are on the, the AB 617 committee in, in Arvin. And they're going to say, well, you did that one in Shafter, now we want one. So, you know, when we looked at the, when we analyzed of the feasibility of a notification pilot that I, that I proposed, it was based on a, one specific material in one specific area. You know, if, if, Arvin demands that, it's going to be an entirely different thing, and it's, it's not really going to be the same, and it may not be the same effect. So that's no longer necessarily on the table, but I honestly believe that the Shafter Committee should look at it as a win, that they've secured $10 million for the state to look at a statewide notification program. Well, we're going to have more discussion about this, but I appreciate your comments today, and I appreciate you being here uh, just to address those. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Cash. Supervisor Perez. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. I really appreciate the job you do. I think you do a great job. Thank you. And, uh, and I appreciate you. You've had an opportunity to hear, uh, at least secondhand, I'm not sure how many of these board sessions you've heard folks come down that are uh, upset, uh, they are feel misinformed, feel as though something is being hidden from them. Sure. Uh, True or not true, that is how. 
Many people feel they come to us every week. This is our problem more than it is yours. I understand that. But we have a perception issue here. And I am wondering what, why you, uh, what is your best explanation as to why these folks who are not dumb people seem to have a different understanding of our current obligations and even practicality for, for what's even helpful. What do you believe is going on? Because all the technical stuff is, is obviously relevant. I, did, I don't think it's terribly helpful for the <coughs> conversation. So I want to get to how do we you know, help get everybody on the same page? Uh, what do you think is missing? I don't know if I can answer, uh, Supervisor Perez through the chair, um, I don't know if I can answer what, what the best way to move forward is or how to get everybody on the same page, but I appreciate that question because it brings up a point which I didn't really address, which is um, there, there is some implication that growers, and by extension me, have something to hide about, uh, about these applications. And, and as I mentioned, um, you know, I can't do anything about illegal applications unless we happen to be doing surveillance and we find it out or we find it out after the fact some way. Then we take an action. But for these legal applications that, that an NOI, um, uh, that go about as a result of an NOI that we look at, specifically each one, um, before we approve them, um, these are legal applications and, and the public needs to understand that they're approved they're, they have many eyes on them. There's all kinds of, you know, there's, there's a federal label for a pesticide that has to be followed. There's a state label and state regulations, there's, or state law. There's regulations for the California Department of Pesticide Regulation. And then there's local permit conditions, which is kind of a nuanced way of saying what we're dealing with here. Um, in case there's local uh, issues that come up, I can implement particular requirements just for Kern County or just for locations in Kern County. Um, so the growers don't have anything to hide. Everything that they do is all on record after the fact um, that anybody can request um, what use reports on particular locations if they happen to live by them. This is all above board um, legal applications that are a record is made of. Glenn, what is the purpose of the notifications? Thinking about the spirit of the law or the legislative intent. What is the purpose of the notification? I think the, the entire purpose is to add a, an additional set of eyes on an application of a pesticide that could be more, more dangerous than any other general pesticide. So, it, so it's not to notify the public this bad pesticide is coming? No. Well, that's what, that's what is wanted or that's the desire of the people that come up um, to talk to you or the shafter group for notification, that's what they want, is notification ahead of time so that they can change something about their behavior. But in general, the, the reason that notification of, of restrictive materials exists at all in the state is for more toxic materials that the state wanted another level of protection prior to that application. And that's what we, that's what my office does. Do this bureaucratic process in theory people will behave better because somebody's watching. Right. That's the idea. Right. And Why so, do people have the impression that they should be informed beforehand? I think because they don't trust the government. I mean, they don't trust my don't department them. to do... Well, yeah, I mean... You, A lot of people don't. Depends on what, what, <laughs> what part of the government. Them. I mean, we just saw some, <laughs> some of those you. people. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, th there are other issues that I'm worried about, you know, because uh, I have to I have to protect growers as well as the public. Right. And Absolutely. so in, in these these examples of no, uh, notification of the public that we've had, there have been some issues. Um, as I said, most of the people that signed up for notification aren't residents of the locations where the pesticide applications would occur. Also, um, some when when some of these notifications went out, activist groups sent out notices that said, hey, call the Ag Commissioner and, and tell them to, to deny this, this application because it's unsafe, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of a hassle. Also, the activist groups in some cases submitted um, um, complaints about the approval or you know, wanting the state, you know, they filed appeals for the approval to the state, which, which resulted in, um, I believe, a one-month delay in the application that the grower could, could make the application. And essentially, they didn't get to make the application, I believe, because it was too long. Because by that time, when you're dealing with a pest pressure, you need to address it somewhat immediately. And a, a one-month uh, bureaucratic delay while the state 
looks at uh, an NOI and whether the, the Ag Commissioner approved it correctly, that's, that's not a doable um, activity for the grower to have to go through. So I'm worried about that. Um, there's also a notification for beekeepers um, for substances that are toxic to bees. So you can register as a beekeeper and receive notice if there's going to be an application near your hives. In Ventura County, somebody registered as a beekeeper without any hives at their house location, they received notification. It wasn't even a restricted material, so it wasn't really a, necessarily a dangerous material, it was just toxic to bees. They received notification and an activist group sent out a notice. And the farmer's family was accosted on the street when they were walking. So I don't think that's reasonable either. So I, I, I don't know what the happy medium is, but that's why we're in the talks with the state about how to develop a I see, program. I see, that's very helpful. Uh, so I think we need, and I wanna propose uh, Supervisor Couch, uh, and I maybe to meet with you and maybe a member of a group or, uh, or you know, so that we can have a sort of knockout, drag out fight, not in public, preferably, uh, about, you know, how we get on the same page. As my experience has been, and I meet with people a lot who are not big fans of mine, uh, and when I'm straight with people, I just feel like you know, a lot of walls come down and we can at least try to get on the same page, even if we walk away and don't like each other still. It's totally okay. But we have to be straight with people. And we, this is an issue that is not going away. I see the feds are cracking down on pesticides. It, this is an issue that's going to be of increasing concern. And in a community that depends heavily, right, on our billion dollar agribusiness, I just think it behooves us to you know, get on the same page with our workforce and our and our growers and say, you know, here's what's reasonable, here's what's cost prohibitive, here's what we can do, here's what we can't do, and, and try to find some middle ground. I just, I, I just don't know why we haven't done that and why, and what is preventing us from doing that moving forward. You're brilliant. You can defend your positions. I don't have any doubt about that. Uh, and I know that you're concerned and want to do a good job. Uh, David has got both farmers and farm workers in his district, and they're sort of at each other's throat. And that's no fun, because they're both of his constituents, and we have to find some resolution. The public believes that this government is going to side with the farmers every time. True or not, that's the perception. We have to fix that, because the, our agribusiness is too important to Kern County. Our reputation, right? movie it's too important and I have every reason to believe that we're doing things properly uh, I'd like to know more and I want to propose David we could talk about this offline you know have trying to have that conversation because what you're telling me and what I'm hearing from the public is such a profound disconnect yeah I just I, I don't understand how that has happened on a subject matter that is so critical to our you know existence sure, so I, really I, thank you and it, thank you. i don't really want to carry on anymore about okay. this but i but i do want to get together with you and i do think we can get on the same page and we can learn and and do better uh, because we're a county of expertise on this matter and we really should be advising the state and i think we can do a lot better so Agreed. i appreciate you but i do think we need to sort of get into the weeds with folks so so that we're on the same page i want to offer myself as a you know vessel to make that happen uh, uh you know on behalf of folks that i think uh, you know, I can help facilitate a conversation with. Sure. Thank you. That. Thank you, Supervisor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next I would like to call on uh, Chief Aaron Duncan to uh, share an update with us on the French fire. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Chairman Peters and members of the board. On, I just wanted to be here today to give you a brief update on the French fire. On August 19th at approximately 1623, 423 in the afternoon, a, um, a fire was reported on federal land one mile north of Waggy Flat Road and Sawmill Road in the Kern River Valley. Our Kern County Fire Department Helicopter 408 was first on scene and described a fire approximately five acres established in heavy brush and timber one mile north of the Waggy Flat and Sawmill Road. 
Our firefighters immediately requested Kern County Sheriff's Office to evacuate Waggy Flats and Sawmill Road. Firefighters immediately upgraded the response and ordered more equipment, uh, strike teams, engines, and crews and aircraft. I want to take a second to expand on that community. Uh, Supervisor Peters, as you know, was our visit last week. Um, Sawmill Road is a very narrow and windy road. It's, a, it's, it's one blend lane, it's in and out, um, only one car can pass at a time. You have a fire well established one mile north of Waggy Flats. As a firefighter, you arrive on scene and you're faced with a 25 mile an hour wind at your face coming from the north. So you have a fire north of you with wind pushing it down towards you. You have houses everywhere. You're dealing with extreme drought. You're dealing with triple digit temperatures, single digit RHs, and we have no known fire history in this area. Our number one goal was to evacuate the area and keep the fire from surround, uh, affecting any of the surrounding communities. In the first two hours of the French fire, it was wind driven, it was spotting, it was laying over on itself, and it came down out of that drainage like a torch. Unfortunately, we lost nine residents and 10 outbuildings that day, but on a positive note, we had zero reported injuries to the firefighters or to the public. Your Kern County Fire Department joined into unified command with the Bureau of Land Management, United States Forest Service, and CAL FIRE. A type two incident management team was ordered, Nobles is the IC. Since then, the fire has grown to 16,000 acres and the fire is being held south of Highway 155 on the north end, east of Granite Road, west of Walford Heights Boulevard. There are currently 1,025 firefighters fighting the French fire. Uh, evacuation orders are in place of the communities of Waggy Flats, Palo Ranches, Shirley Meadows, Alta Sierra, Slick Rock, Dutch Flat, Isabella Highlands, Keysville, and Walford Heights. And I wanna clarify, these are orders. These are telling people to leave their communities. We are currently affecting 2,172 residents in those communities. We have an evacuation set up at the Kern Valley High School gym and also at the Woodrow Wallace Elementary School. As your fire chief and the director of emergency services working with Georgiana Armstrong and her staff, we've opened the EOC and we've update, upgraded it to level two. Working with your department heads, uh, we are in process, or I'm sorry, we are supporting the evacuation centers and I just want to notify, I just want to recognize uh, a few people. Human services, human services employee Mike Nisser, and he's in charge of setting up the shelters. Uh, the Kern County Sheriff's Office for assisting with evacuations in all of our communities. Uh, public health for, for, for providing nurses and uh, uh, implementing COVID protocols. Animal services, Nick Cullen couldn't be here because he's currently working the animal shelter in that area because we know that people will not leave and evacuate their homes if they can't take their animals. So he's, he's doing a key, ro uh, key role for us right now. Uh, behavioral health is involved, providing community support, general services is providing facilities assistance. Uh, aging and adult services, they're taking calls because we have access and functional needs people in that area and they're coordinating with Kern Regional Transit to get people out. We've activated the uh, Kern River Valley CERT program and they're assisting volunteering. Uh, nonprofits such as the Red Cross and Salvation Army are assisting with feeding our evacuated uh, community members. In closing, I want to take a minute to recognize our Kern County firefighters. The last five days, our firefighters have been in a fight. This is a fire that we've never seen before in an area we have no history on. Each day, the fire keeps coming at us in the different communities in Kern River Valley, and each day, my firefighters keep beating them back. Um, all year long, you hear me talk about hazard reduction and the importance of it and how vital our crews are to our communities. Specifically speaking, our crew 479, which has been working in the Alta Sierra area for the last three years on grant project, has been critical to building a, a safe working space for the area of Alta Sierra. Last night, the fire was underneath Alta Sierra. It was to the west of Alta Sierra, and our guys were in a fight. We had our helicopters running all night long on night vision, trying to drop water to keep the fire out of that community. I had crews engaged, I had engines engaged. That work that those crews do in preparation, the last two years on that, three years on that, um, on that project work was tested and that community held up. And I'm so proud of my guys for everything they've done there. Additionally, with the French uh, fire, we have 180 Kern County firefighters on this fire. That's a third of my staff on that fire alone. I have newly promoted people at all ranks, as you've seen on my social media, and they've all stepped in and they're all performing wonderfully. 
my new division chiefs that you've granted me are all engaged at a critical role and they are they're serving well <sighs> the french fire isn't our only fire as you see up north the dixie fire and the many fires in northern california kern county is still supporting those fires up there so we have the french fire all the northern california fires and we still have every fire station open, every piece of equipment staffed, and we're here to protect our community. In closing, I want to say my firefighters, your firefighters are stepping up. They're coming back to work. They're here for our communities. And as your fire chief, I couldn't be more proud. I'm here if you have any questions for me. Thank you, Thank you very much, Chief Duncan. Uh, as you mentioned, I uh, came up and uh, we visited uh, last week, and I got to see firsthand the I mean, the devastation up there is unbelievable. I mean, it's a tragedy up there for, for those residents, but my hat's off to you uh, for the way you've structured the department and to your firefighters because they were just absolutely phenomenal up there and they're doing a great job. And I did want to, to add on top of the uh, shelters that are uh, currently open at uh, Wallace, or excuse me, Woodrow Wallace uh, Elementary and the Kerrville High School, uh, they did also open up the rodeo grounds at the, uh, or excuse me, in Kernville, so they can uh, bring livestock down there and people can bring their camp trailers uh, if they happen to be closer to that area. But uh, you guys are doing a phenomenal job. Uh, keep up the good work, and you know, we're here to support you however we can as well. Are there any other questions or comments from the board? Yes, sir. Supervisor Couch? Just quickly, it's entirely inadequate, but just tell them thank you, and we're proud of them. Will do. Absolutely. Supervisor Maggard. Thank you, Chief. Could you give us some feel for how we are uh, refreshing, sustaining, replenishing the 180 people that are out there on the line? You know, the, the, nobody can work forever. So how, how do we manage that? So last night, we actually worked a double shift on our crews because we knew of how important that fight was. But typically, they come off and we rotate other partner agencies involved. So we have a mutual aid system, which like I mentioned with CAL FIRE, Bureau of Land Management, and the Forest Service. So it's a team effort. So we get help from other communities up and down the state and we give that same help. So we've had equipment from Ventura, from Northern California, all here to assist Kern County. So with the assistance we receive from others and your efforts to do that, do you, can we sustain the effort? Is that, or are we anywhere near a point where we cannot do that? No, we can sustain. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. I, too, am grateful for everybody's good work. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Maggard. Any other questions or comments? All right. Well, thank thank you. you, Chief. I appreciate it. Have a good day. You, too. Hey, next, I would like to call on Director of Kern County Public Health, Bryn Kerrigan, to give us an update on the COVID-19 pandemic. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Yesterday, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine for those who are 16 and older. This product will now be branded as Comirnaty. The vaccine continues to be available under emergency use authorization, known as EUA, for those who are 12 to 15 years of age and for the administration of the third dose and those who are immunocompromised. EUAs can be used by the FDA during public health emergencies to provide access to medical products that may be effective in preventing, diagnosing, or treating a disease, provided the FDA determines the known and potential benefits of a product outweigh the known and potential risks of the product. FDA-approved vaccines undergo the agency's standard process for reviewing the quality, safety, and effectiveness of medical products. This process includes a review of the preclinical and clinical data and information and the details of the manufacturing process, vaccine testing results, and inspections of where the vaccine is made. Last week, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services released a statement related to COVID-19 booster shots. This statement indicated that while COVID-19 vaccines in the United States continue to be remarkably effective in reducing the risk of severe disease, hospitalization, and death, the available data shows that protection begins to wane over time. Subject to the FDA conducting an independent evaluation and determination of the safety and effectiveness of a third dose of 
the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, the CDC's advisory committee on the immunization practices issuing booster dose recommendations based on a thorough review of the evidence. Booster doses will be available starting September 20th and eight months following an individual's second dose. As of Sunday, 707,955 doses of the COVID-19 vaccine have been administered to Kern County residents. As of today, 338,023 people or 44.8% of Kern's eligible population have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Another 66,435 people have one dose of their two dose series, meaning 53.6% of Kern's eligible population is at least partially vaccinated. 68% of our 65 and older population are fully vaccinated and 25.7% of our 12 to 17 year old population is fully vaccinated. We have seen a 50.6% increase in first doses over the past three weeks when compared to the previous three weeks in Kern County. Most of the transmission that we continue to see in individuals in Kern County is amongst those who are unvaccinated. Our average daily case rate over the past 14 days is 32.35 per 100,000 people. Our vaccina vaccinated average daily case rate is 0.8 per uh, 100,000 people, while our unvaccinated average daily case rate is 49.38 per 100,000 people. Over the last 14 days, 99.13% of our cases are amongst those who are unvaccinated. Since January 21st, Kern County has had 27,589 cases with 27,355 or 99.15% being amongst those who are unvaccinated and 234 or 0.85% being amongst those who are fully vaccinated. 0.07% of our fully vaccinated population has tested positive for COVID-19. We have had 1,524 COVID-related hospitalizations since January 21st, 2021. 1,509 or 99.02% were in those who were unvaccinated and uh, 15 or 0.98% being in those who were vaccinated. 0.004% of our vaccinated population has been hospitalized with COVID-19. We are also monitoring those who have been reinfected with COVID-19. Reporting on reinfection of COVID-19 becomes difficult because sometimes we have people um, with persistent positive tests for months following their original diagnosis. Kern County has identified 629 individuals who have positive tests more than 90 days from their initial positive test, meaning they likely have a reinfection. This equates to 0.52% of our residents who have had COVID-19 that have been reinfected as compared to 0.07% of our vaccinated population who have had a post-vaccination infection. There have been 110 hospitalizations and in individuals who have been reinfected with COVID-19. 39 were only hospitalized during their first infection. 55 were only hospitalized during their second infection and 16 were hospitalized during both infections. Those who were hospitalized during their second infection or following the development of some level of natural immunity totals 71 or 0.059% of the Kern County population who has had COVID-19 before. For comparison, 0.004% of the vaccinated population has been hospitalized. The state has modeling that we review weekly to assist in our planning. This modeling shows that our cases and our hospitalizations are increasing and will likely continue to increase. Each model has two scenarios, an optimistic scenario and a pessimistic scenario. Currently, the pessimistic scenario in the modeling suggests that our average daily cases will peak on September 11th with 369 new cases per day. And the optimistic modeling suggests that our average daily cases will peak on September 3rd with 365 new cases per day. 
The pessimistic scenario for hospitalizations suggests that our COVID-related hospitalizations will peak on September 28th with 364 hospitalizations, and the optimistic scenario suggests that our COVID-related hospitalizations will peak on September 18th with 198 hospitalizations. Our actual hospitalizations trend along the pessimistic model. As of Monday, we had 236 COVID-related hospitalizations with four in the ICU. As of yesterday, Kern County's hospital system had 223 staffable available regular hospital beds and 40 staffable available ICU beds. Kern's ICU capacity is at 20.8% and the San Joaquin Regional ICU capacity is at 12.8%. I meet with all the Kern Hospital CEOs on a weekly basis to continue to prepare for the surge. The state has recently supplied partial fulfillment of staffing requests at six of our local hospitals. Specifically, the state is supplying 39 nursing staff to Kern County through mid-October. There are an additional six pending staffing resource requests that the state is cur currently working on filling. Additionally, we continue to maintain our alternative care site, which can be deployed with about a week's notice. As with earlier COVID surges, we are experiencing a significant increase in our 911 system call volume and a strain on our emergency response system. Specifically, comparing the past three months to the prior three months, we have seen a 14% increase in our 911 call volume. Over the past six months, we have seen a 36% increase in our 911 call volume. Our ambulance decontamination volumes have increased from 24 in the month of June to 128 during the month of July to 315 so far during the month of August. The decontamination process is required every time a COVID positive or suspected case is transported by an ambulance and the process can remove an ambulance from the system for hours. In December 2020, we introduced an emergency medical system surge plan with alterations to the typical operations of the system of care. These alterations are designed to provide the best level of patient care by integrating additional resources and helping to prioritize our responses as our system becomes further impacted by the pandemic. This week, we will move from level one to level two of the surge plan. This means that ambulances will only respond to low acuity 911 calls when there are sufficient resources available. If an ambulance is not available to be dispatched, the caller will be informed of the situation and provided with other options for obtaining care, including contacting a primary care physician or an urgent care. Additionally, the county has integra integrated an additional emergency response agency into the system to respond to low acuity calls when ambulances are not available. Uh, we did implement this surge plan um, in the second surge and it was really helpful in helping with the hospitals and decompressing the call volume that was being received at the hospitals and on the 911 system. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, that concludes my update. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Hill. Are there any questions or comments from the board? I have just one question. Could we? That's a lot of numbers there, and I appreciate that. Could you send us that? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Um, Mike. Uh, uh, well, I don't. I'm not great at numbers. I went to law school for that very reason. Uh, you clearly are phenomenal at numbers. So thank you uh, for that large picture. You know, if you had to wrap that up, uh, how would you advise this board about how we should think about this issue moving forward? Sure, um, Supervisor Perez to the chair. Um, just in general, we're in a third surge. Um, we're almost to the peak as according to the state's projections, which is good news for us. Yeah. And it seems as though our hospital system is equipped and being added resources um, regularly as they're requested in order to keep up with the demand that's being placed on them. That doesn't mean that they're not being burdened. That doesn't mean that they're not under a lot of stress, um, but we are using all of the resources in that we have available to us to try to decompress that system and make sure that the help that our community needs when they absolutely need it is there and available to them. What should we be doing that we're not doing? 
Um, just continuing our messaging. We need to encourage people to get vaccinated. It's proving, um, it, it's proof when you look at the local numbers that that is the most effective way for us to reduce transmission, to reduce severe illness, to reduce hospitalization and death. So we need to push vaccination. And for those that choose not to get vaccinated, they need to use every preventative measure that they possibly can um, in their daily lives so that we can get the transmission in our community down. So for folks who are not vaccinated and don't like the mask because it is a pain, uh, what would you say to them? Um, the masks help. They do help. It's a layer of protection, and we all need to be using every layer of protection that we possibly can. Masking is one of many layers of protections. Physical distancing is another. Staying home when you're sick or when you've been exposed and could become sick. Um, washing your hands often. Staying just in overall general good health. Those are all layers of protection. So using as many as we possibly can in our life is going to help us reduce transmission of this disease. Thank you. When can kids be vaccinated and how do you think our schools are doing? <laughs> uh, that's a difficult question. Um, we believe don't that- do you have a crystal ball? I don't have a crystal ball. I wish I did. Um, we believe that vaccinations for those that are under 12 maybe will be available in late fall, early winter. Um, it is in clinical trials right now, so we're hoping the sooner the better. Um, our schools are, are doing okay. It's a new system. Contact tracing is very difficult, but they're doing it and they're doing it well. So if you see exposures, if you see positives that result in exposures and people being quarantined, that means contact tracing is working. So we want to keep all of our kids in school as much as possible, but that requires us to do um, thorough contact tracing and make sure we're quarantining and isolating those that are potential exposures. And vaccinating, of course. Yes, and getting vaccinated. Well, my children attend BCSD, and I'll tell you, they're the staff and everybody associated with uh, the school that my kids attend is completely obsessive about these issues, about safety. They are not playing any games, and they really want the kids there. They really want to teach the kids. You know, it's it's a beautiful thing to see. I am so grateful, but certainly looking forward to that vaccination for children, for those who choose to do that, uh, a real measure of peace of mind, because every day it kind of feels like, you know, a risk. Absolutely. Thank you for your work and for that thorough presentation. I appreciate that you can send it to us. Uh, thank you so much. Absolutely. I had a quick question real quick. Um, with the fire going on up in the Kern River Valley, the, the air quality up there is absolutely terrible. And um, we have a lot of medically fragile, a lot of elderly people up there. Uh, as, as a result of that and, you know, just the fires burning around the states and the, the resulting air quality that we've had, have we seen any kind of increase in uh, respiratory issues or people coming in with those types of issues that you're aware of? Uh, Supervisor Peters, we have not seen any increases yet, um, but that's not to say that we won't see increases. We have been doing, we've been trying to do a lot of messaging, and I know fi the fire department has helped in sharing that messaging as well with tips for people to use to stay out of the smoky air mm -hmm. in hopes that we can prevent that from happening. Great. Thank you very much. Sure. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Uh, you're doing a great job as director. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, any other reports or comments from the board? Okay, seeing none, we will go to uh, item number 18 now under the County Administrative Office, and that is the presentation of the 2019-2020 Employee Recognition Awards. And I will, yeah, that's what that was right there. Okay, I'm so sorry. Uh, board member announcements and reports. I just wanted to say to Kathy Krause, happy birthday. <laughs> Not just your birthday today, but former supervisor Michael Rubio and also dear, my dear friend John Haddad all today. So clearly a special day, Kathy, that uh, you were born on. So uh, you, had, you are the most important of all those mentioned, of course. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Okay, and then for item number 18, I will turn it over to uh, Mr. Devin Brown. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Well, we moved this to the morning because we thought there was going to be a lengthy uh, afternoon presentation. So I want to thank those uh, folks 
<laughs> who stuck it out with us today, this morning. Uh, hopefully we can end this meeting, uh, morning meeting on some good news and sharing some good stories about our county employees. We're doing a bit of catch up uh, on these awards, as you can tell. These awards are for our 2019-2020 recipients uh, of our employee recognition awards. Uh, obviously we're uh, playing catch up because of the COVID-19 public health emergency and some of the restrictions that have uh, put uh, ceremonies like this in, um, in uh, delay. So uh, I wanna take this opportunity to thank also all of our employees who have been helping uh, our community throughout this pandemic. Uh, although these uh, awards note, note some of those uh, exceptional cases, uh, the vast majority of our workforce, if not all of them, have been uh, working very hard and uh, dealing with a lot different circumstances than they're uh, normally accustomed to, uh, to help our community through this time. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna, uh, we have a few of our recipients that are here today. Uh, we're gonna, we have our, our awards over here to my right. Uh, and I wanna just briefly run down uh, a couple of the recipients uh, who are not here, uh, uh, and so that we can um, acknowledge them. Uh, the first one is for outstanding leadership, our battalion chief, Brandon Smith, uh, who many of you are aware of. Uh, he's worked for the fire department for many years uh, and served in a leadership capacity uh, for, for many years as well. I, I'm sure he is uh, no doubt involved with the fire protection up and down the state, uh, protecting our, our property and people from the wildfires that are occurring in our county and other counties. Mr. Smith uh, was nominated for his, specifically for his work as the EOC director during the beginning stages of the, the pandemic response. Uh, the Emergency Operations Center was uh, activated to assist our public health department in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and Mr. Smith served as the EO, EOC director for that uh, period of time. Uh, required uh, definitely a lot of coordination and skill, uh, co communication, and the ability to uh, set a path and, uh, and follow it. The EOC response was successful in competing, completing a wide variety of assignments, um, specifically coordination with uh, community feeding programs, uh, setting up of COVID-19 test sites, establishment of temporary housing for homeless persons at high risk of COVID-19, and contingency planning for county operations, uh, all of which Mr. Smith helped uh, coordinate and lead, uh, and we recognize him for his outstanding leadership. Uh, wish he could be here today. Uh, our second uh, awardee for outstanding leadership uh, is uh, our one of our human services program directors. Uh, she recently retired this past summer. Uh, her name was Jill Christopher. Uh, Ms. Christopher uh, was uh, nominated and selected for outstanding leadership. Uh, due to her work on a project uh, for a complete revision of the hotline process for emergency response. As you know, those are some of our most critical moments uh, for our Human Service CPS uh, Bureau, uh, dealing with um, critical issues coming into our hotline and directing them. There was an issue that had been going on with a backlog of entering referrals based on the reports received on incidents and that did not require an in-person response. Uh, Mrs. Ms. Christopher engaged the hotline team to create a more streamlined process in line with our Lean Six Sigma and continuous improvement philosophies. The new process the team created eliminated all the backlog and the need for overtime work to resolve that backlog. Referrals are now entered the same day and approved by a supervisor for accuracy with the same, within the same week. In March 2020, the Department of Human Services faced dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Ms. Cr Christopher devised a plan in which all the emergency response supervisors would run the hotline remotely from their t laptops, the same as how it, it typically works after hours. Uh, Mrs. Christopher's plan uh, and the supervisors was with the supervisors of the program were able to keep up uh, with all of the incoming calls uh, and, and make sure that that service uh, went ongoing without fail. The arrangement now continues still uh, uh, and was um, completed, uh, well actually it was completed and continued until June 1st of 2020 when our hotline workers returned to the office. Uh, 
so we recognize Miss Christopher her, for her leadership in that regard and wish uh, her, her goodwill and her retirement uh, from the county and thank her for her years of service with us. Uh, now to, to some of the, the participants that are here. Um, first, I'll, I'll uh, in follow up to Ms. Kerrigan's presentation, uh, I want to talk about one of her staff members who's being recognized for customer service excellence. Uh, many of you have, have heard her name. Uh, she's become kind of a local celebrity, I guess, unfortunately. Um, Kim, Kim Hernandez. Uh, who uh, has been present during uh, many, many countless press briefings, has uh, worked diligently to provide our community uh, stakeholders with all the information they need to make decisions uh, related to how they're going to respond to this pandemic. Uh, Ms. Hernandez was nominated for her work in assisting county departments as well with guidance on dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, she assisted with questions regarding exposures, testing, quarantines, etc., and always provided helpful and timely responses. Uh, and that was obviously necessary during such uh, um, critical time periods. Ms. Hernandez participated in live chats with managers and supervisors at the Department of Human Services and also responded to countless questions via telephone call and email communication. Uh, with everything changing so rapidly in this uh, pandemic, uh, she, she was able to keep up and be a steady and reliable resource, uh, helping to establish protocols and tracking exposures and illness among county staff. Uh, Ms. Hernandez's open communication assisted departments greatly in adequately responding to the county's efforts to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and uh, keep our workforce safe. And I know that she's worked with many uh, of our stakeholders throughout our county directly to uh, provide those same uh, customer service uh, levels. Uh, so I want to thank Ms. Hernandez. She's here today. Um, and we have a, a award, uh, which is, is a small token of our gratitude for your, your efforts. Uh, told all of them that they weren't going to have to take pictures or make speeches, but we wanted to make sure that uh, we at least captured some of these moments um, so, since their work was so, um, so important to us. Uh, our next recipient is, is Michelle Ayala uh, for Workforce Excellence. Michelle Ayala is a Human Services Technician 3 with our Department of Human Services. And in her department's district office, uh, it's imperative for someone in her position to be well-rounded. Uh, she works, she's able to adapt to any of the programs, CalWORKs, CalFresh, Medi-Cal, General Assistance, uh, and any position intake, ongoing screening. She's a jack of all trades uh, in her office and helping our community with their needs. She goes above and beyond to meet all agency deadlines while staying abreast of a variety of consistently changing policies and increasingly uh, increasing caseloads. Uh, Ms. Ayala's uh, high work ethic ensures she has the ability to organize and priority her, prioritize her assignments to meet her deadlines, uh, and she also volunteers to help her coworkers when they need her. She takes it upon herself uh, to um, see an obstacle and determine a way to overcome it, and she continually achieves a rate of accuracy above standard on a regular basis. Uh, her efficient processes of managing her caseload allow her to accept additional assignments and she has the, work, uh, the ability to work independently as well as with the team. This is displayed in her commitment to job excellence, which is reflected in the quality of the work she produces. So I want to congratulate Michelle. I don't know if she's here. I'm not familiar. She's not here today, but uh, thank her again for her work uh, with our uh, Department of Human Services. Uh, we have an, the next two are a couple of our uh, retirees. Uh, we had three retirees uh, that received this awards this, this time around. Uh, and I'll start with um, uh, a retiree from our Child Support Services Department. And I know uh, Ms. Chavez, our director, is, is missing him dearly already <laughs> uh, as he just retired this last month. Um, 
And this is for uh, the award for sustained effort. Uh, Brett Sakamoto, who is the assistant director of the Department of Child Support Services, has served the County of Kern uh, for 36 years. Uh, he has had a profound effect on uh, many employees uh, and is regarded as a trusted advisor to four different department directors during his tenure. Staff throughout the office have sought his guidance uh, and his wisdom, knowing that he will be fair and understanding. He has uh, uh, an advanced knowledge of the county, state, and federal funding that has been a great asset to the department. Uh, it's very complex, for sure. Uh, he has provided sound input, advice, and feedback regarding how to successfully manage a relatively flat budget over many years and many changes to business costs and expenses. Uh, he has spearheaded and influenced several innovative programs such as interview, an interview skills class for staff and efficient improvement to their human resources processes, customer service kiosks, health and wellness initiatives, and so much more. Mr. Sakamoto has been an exemplary leader whose hard work and contributions impacted the Department of Child Support Services performance and outcomes and the growth and development of uh, many of the employees within that department. And I'm pleased to have worked with him for many uh, of his years, and he's always been a very level-headed uh, and uh, honorable person. So uh, I know he's here today. Uh, I want to bring him up and give him uh, his award for sustained effort. Thank you. you well in your retirement as well. Uh, Devin, but... Real quick, then. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Excuse me, Devin, <laughs> and thank you, Chair. But I wanted to say to the uh, Child Support Division, you know, what an exceptional job they did with the backpack event uh, at the Museum of Kern County Museum. Is that the Yes, current I believe name? that's right. <clears throat> uh, well, it was Pioneer Village when I was a kid, so I always forget. But uh, it was really a spectacular event, and m mostly the feel and the spirit from the team that is there, you know, is palpable. The excitement, the devotion, it's really, really special. And it really just, I think, improved the quality of life of each other, right? And the work that you're doing, the purpose that you have uh, behind the work you do and, and why you work so hard. My son was just blown away. My, he kept walking around saying, I love this place. I love this place, you know, which is a sign, right, of how kids feel there and and how effective you were at making a warm, uh, inviting place that could really keep kids captivated. Really, hats off. I think that's a hard thing to do. So thank you. Our next recipient is uh, also for sustained effort, um, Lieutenant Kevin Wright uh, with the Sheriff's Office. Uh, Mr. Wright has, was nominated for his work over the many years as a Sheriff's Detentions Lieutenant at the Laredo Detentions Facility. Um, Lieutenant Wright has been described as the go-to guy whenever an emergency develops or an operation needs to be planned because of his calm and level-headed approach. Uh, he prioritizes the safety and security of staff and what is the best interest in the, of the Sheriff's Office as a whole. Lieutenant Wright was assigned to the COVID-19 Detentions Bureau Operations Center in March of 2020 and demonstrated outstanding leadership day in and day out. His attitude is always positive and his work ethic is unmatched, giving 110% of himself at all hours of the day, seven days a week. Lieutenant Wright conducts himself professionally and represents the department well with members of the public and members of other agencies that he deals with on a daily basis. And he's a, an individual who's also been selected by even his command staff to represent him at the bar, them at the bargaining table. So that's uh, an, an unenviable task. Uh, and I've had the pleasure of working with him in that respect for, for several years. And I can say that I really enjoyed uh, his leadership and his approach to negotiations and uh, always trying to make sure that he understands what's going on and has a has a good uh, approach to that. So uh, I'm going to miss him for sure. And I remember hearing that he was retiring. <laughs> and uh, although I, I I hope he has a, a lovely retirement, I'm go I'm going to miss dealing with him uh, in particular. So uh, I think he's here. And I want to bring him up and give him his award and thank him for his service.
Okay, last but not least uh, is our teamwork award for exceptional teamwork. Uh, and I know we've got uh, a group of them out here today from our probation department. Uh, the title of their team is Stockdale Helping Hands. And I'll explain a little bit uh, about what that means. That includes Jessica Cortez, Sarah Radney, Victoria Anderson, Maura Rivas, uh, and Abril Tabarez. Uh, they, created, uh, they were created to provide basic necessities such as clothing, shoes, and hygiene items as a solution to combat truancy, prevent further involvement within the juvenile justice system, build self-esteem, and help build a foundation for academic success. The primary focus of the Stockdale Helping Hands team uh, are socially, socioeconomically disadvantaged youth of color, ages 13 uh, to 18, that are currently involved within the juvenile justice system. In addition to their regular duties as Kern County probation officers, this team developed the Stockdale Helping Hands logo, collaborated with community schools, searched for grants, initiated fundraising, collected donations, clipped coupons, and shopped to uh, stock supplies based on the youth's needs. An example of this exceptional program is with one of the very first youth to benefit from the Stockdale Helping Hands program. Accompanied by his grandmother, uh, this youth was able to pick out several pairs of pants and shirts, but was most excited about being able to have his own hygiene products and not have to share with his grandmother. The board of Stockdale Helping Hands has, have demonstrated exemplary efforts and commitment in carrying out the probation department's mission, values, and goals. And I want to honor them today uh, and uh, give them the award for team, exceptional teamwork. Uh, so if you can come up and grab it and take a picture. Uh, Just another example of the wonderful work our probation department does and our probation officers perform for our county uh, community. Well, that ends our, uh, our award presentations for the day. Uh, we are going to be back in a new way this, this year, and I'm sure we're going to have very, very many uh, um, applicants for this upcoming year. As I said, a lot of our employees have provided exceptional uh, work and have gone above and beyond during this COVID-19 pandemic. So we're going to catch the backhand half of, of that uh, in our 2021-22 20, uh, awards, uh, which will be uh, coming up next year. Uh, so I want to thank your board's uh, uh, indulgence and uh, for allowing us to recognize a few of our outstanding employees uh, from this year past. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak on this? Any questions or comments from the board? Okay, seeing none and having no more items to consider in open session, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn to closed session to consider item 57 under the county administrative office. So moved. Without objection, we're adjourned.